got JPEGs, TIFFs, PSD, RAW, HEAF. What file type should you be using for your photography? I'll talk all about it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Here I am, as always, answering your photography questions right here on Adorama TV. If you've got a photo question, you should know what to do by now. You just go to askdavidbergman.com and submit that form right there on the site. I just might pick your question to answer on a future show. Today's question was sent in by Jeremy, and he wants to know, I edit all of my photos in Photoshop and save them as PSD files. Because the files are so big, I flatten each image after processing, which results in a smaller file size. Since the images are flattened, is there any harm in just converting them to JPEGs? And Jeremy's question was actually a little longer than that, and he went on to ask about image degradation for the different file types if he edits his images later. He also let me know that he does keep his original RAW files in a separate folder, so he can always go back and redo the edit from scratch if he wants. So thanks, Jeremy, for sending in that question and explaining your situation. Now, there are a bunch of different file types, and there are different reasons why you'd shoot or save to those formats. I'm going to go through the ones that photographers should know about, and then I'll answer your particular question and tell you how I handle my own images at the end. So what are we actually talking about here? Well, if you shoot with a digital camera, you probably know all of those individual images are separate files. Every file has an extension at the end that normally tells you what file type it is. The extension is the three or four letters after the dot. So you might have an image file named something like xbrs4723.jpg. And since that ends with .jpg, we know that file xbrs4723 is a JPEG file but there are different file types that can be used for photography. The first thing to be aware of is that you can choose what file type you want to be generated by the camera. Now that file type is what's saved to your digital card right when you're shooting, and there are usually two or three options depending on the camera that you're using. If you then copy those files to your computer and do some editing to them, when you're done, you can then save those new images that you just created with your edits. Now, if you're using a program like Photoshop, you have a lot of file format options to, cho to choose from at that point. Each file format has, it, has its own pros and cons, so I'm gonna go through them one at a time. Let's start with RAW files. Now, RAW is simply the unprocessed data captured by the sensor in your camera. It's not really a finished photo per se, because the data doesn't have some things applied to it yet, like white balance and tone curves and sharpening and a whole bunch of other things. I like to think of it like a negative from the film days. It's just the first part of the process of making an image. Then when you print that negative in the darkroom, there are some other decisions that you can make to drastically change the look of that photo. Raw files work the same way. You can choose to shoot raw in your camera, and those are the files you're gonna have on your digital card. But then you need to open those in a raw converter program like Lightroom, Photoshop, which has um, uh, camera raw built into it, or Capture One. Now in there, you'll set all of those parameters to make the final images look how you want. Now the extension on RAW files is different depending on what camera brand you shoot with. The camera manufacturers, they don't release the SDK for their RAW files, and they protect that secret sauce with their life. Canon's files are currently, the newest ones are .CR3 files, Nikon is .NEF or NEF files, and Sony is .ARW, and so on and so on. And while you can shoot RAW files in the camera, as far as I know, there's no way to save a RAW file after doing some editing. RAW is one and done. It's simply the data from the sensor, untouched and unedited. Technically, it's the highest possible quality image that you can have. Although, again, I said it's not really an image yet, but that is what it is. Now, there are really only two downsides to shooting RAW. First, they're relatively large files, so they take up a lot of space on your cards and your hard drives. And second, since each type of RAW file is a proprietary format, that means that those uh, files might not be compatible with all RAW converters, right? So, of course, it's going to work with the camera manufacturer's programs, but Apple, Adobe, and Phase One, they all have to reverse engineer the files after each new camera is released. Sometimes that takes some time for them to get to actually finish it, and also it's going to look different. Your RAW file is going to look different depending on which program you use. Now, there is another RAW format called DNG, which stands for Digital Negative. DNG was released by Adobe in 2004 to try to remedy at least one of those issues. DNG is a universal open source RAW format. The hope was that most of the photo industry would switch to DNG so we wouldn't have this Tower of Babel that we currently have with all the cameras speaking a different language. In theory, 
It's a great idea. But honestly, I don't think it's really lived up to the hype. Only a few of the companies uh, have cameras that natively produce DNG files. The big three, Canon, Nikon, and Sony, do not. Yes, you can convert your RAW files to DNG in the computer using free Adobe software, but that adds an extra step and takes time, especially if you have a lot of images. Now, I did a much longer video breaking down all the pros and cons of RAW versus DNG. I'll put a link to that down below so you can watch that later. But in my opinion, unless you have a camera that shoots DNG natively, I wouldn't bother with that format. Next, let's talk about TIFF files. The extension TIFF stands for Tagged Image File Format. You might also see just .tif, and that was created by an early version of Windows that had a three character limit on file extensions. TIFFs are uncompressed image files. Now, some cameras can shoot TIFF files, and it's a widely accepted format that most image editing programs can open and save. Generally, TIFF is just a description of the color of each individual pixel in your photo. Of course, I'm oversimplifying, but it's kind of like saying, okay, the pixel at position 1.1 is blue, 1.2 is blue, one, uh, not one dot, excuse me, one by one is blue, one by two is blue, one by three is green, one by four is red, and so on and so on, until it's mapped out the millions of pixels that it usually takes to make an image. Now, we say that TIFFs are uncompressed because there's no shortcuts here. It has to describe each individual pixel in your image. Even if your image is just all blank white, it still goes through them one by one. Sometimes TIFF files will be requested by publishers, printers, and other pre-press houses because the files are very high quality and don't need any interpretation like a RAW file does. The downside is that TIFF files can be very large, so they take up a lot of space on your cards and hard drives. Now let's get to the most popular image format, JPEG. That stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. Bet you didn't know that. The extension is JPEG or JPG. Now JPEGs are by far the most used format for all photos. They're compatible with just about everything. I don't think there's a camera out there that doesn't give you the option to natively shoot JPEGs. Also, they can be viewed on virtually any web browser, operating system, and device, so you'll never have trouble opening or saving those images. The files are smaller than RAW, so you'll save space and money on cards and hard drives. So, what's the downside? Well, <clears throat> JPEG is a compressed format. To make those files smaller, some data is thrown away. JPEG is almost like a shorthand for viewing your images. While TIFFs describe each, pi each pixel one by one, JPEGs group them together and average them out in the description. So in the case of that blank white image, a JPEG file could simply just say, every pixel is white. That's it, right? That would be a tiny file, while the TIFF would still be the same size as if it was a much more complex photo. Now, because of that shorthand, a JPEG won't have the same level of detail as an uncompressed format. You can choose how much compression you want, though. In Photoshop, you can choose levels from 1 to 12 when you're saving your images. Now, 1 to 12 always makes me laugh a little bit, and I think of the movie Spinal Tap, where that rock band has an amplifier that goes up to 11, because, of course, it's louder than 10. So you can go 1 to 12 in your JPEG compression, but any, either way, if you apply less compression, you're going to have a higher quality image, but also your file sizes are going to be bigger. That's the trade-off. <clears throat> Next is a relatively new format called HEIF. H-E-I-F stands for High Efficiency Image Format. Now, you might also see H-E-I-C, which is High Efficiency Image Container. Now, this is kind of a new version of JPEG, but a compressed, high-quality HEIF file actually has higher dynamic range at half the size of a JPEG. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Now, Canon can shoot HEIF files by activating a not-so-intuitive menu item called HDRPQ. Most notably, though, Apple iPhones shoot HEIC by default because they're great when you have limited device storage, they transfer over net a network quickly, and they save space in the cloud. The downside is that Heath isn't widely adopted yet, although you could argue that Apple's use of the technology makes it mainstream. But the reality is that on an iPhone, file types are mostly hidden behind the scenes. If you want to share one of those images out of your phone and over email or text, there's actually a setting in your phone so you can change, you can choose it from either high efficiency, which is going to send that original HEIC file, or most compatible, which converts it to a JPEG to guarantee that the recipient is going to be able to open it. Okay, let's get to a few more file types. The, the ones I've already mentioned are usually available to shoot in camera. The rest of these are generally only for saving files on a computer or another device, and I'll go through them fairly quickly before giving my advice about what to use. 
Now, PSD stands for Photoshop Document, and it's exactly that. It not only stores a version of your photo, but also keeps all of the other Photoshop-specific features, including layers, masks, alpha channels, clipping paths, and a whole bunch more. PSDs are uncompressed, and as you can imagine, they are big files. Because Photoshop is so popular, there are some third-party programs that'll open PSD files, but generally, these are made to be used in Photoshop only. Now, there are some other file types like PNG, GIF, and BMP that can be used for photos, but generally, these are aimed at graphic designers who use images and other artwork, but not ideal for photographers. PNG is best when you need a transparent layer, GIF, uh, GIF or GIF, depending on how you pronounce it, right? Um, it big debate about that. That's good for animation, and BMP was originally a Windows-only format, so it really isn't widely accepted. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's talk about Jeremy's question. Now, I need to define a couple things first. First is non-destructive editing. Simply put, a non-destructive workflow allows you to go back later and pick up where you were on your edits without any change in the quality of your image. Working on RAW files in Lightroom or Capture One or uh, Adobe Camera Raw is non-destructive. You can move around all the sliders for exposure, white balance, clarity, any, any of those sliders. And I'm not actually, it's not actually changing the pixels. It's just keeping a set of instructions for when you export a version of that file. The file you export will have all of that stuff applied and be a final image like a TIFF or a JPEG. Now you can't save out a new raw file, like I said before. If you open that exported file and made changes, that is destructive. If you make an extreme change, like trying to drastically alter the exposure or color, it's just not gonna work very well. However, if you go back into Lightroom or Capture One, you can change as many sliders as you want and save out another version with those new settings applied. Now, the other term I need to go over is image degradation. I already said that when you use a compressed format like JPEG or HEIF, you're throwing out some of the data in the file. If you work on the raw files and export a JPEG, then open up that JPEG, do some edits, and then save out a JPEG again, it throws out even more of that data. In theory, you do that enough times and the quality is gonna keep getting worse and worse. In practice though, as long as you keep your compression level low, you probably won't notice it after a few saves. Now this also brings up the topic of what file format you should shoot in camera. I prefer RAW because it's the original data from the sensor and I can make big changes if I want and it's non-destructive. Some photographers do like to shoot JPEGs only because they're smaller file sizes and don't need any time to be converted. I guess if you're a high volume headshot photographer that's doing very little retouching, I suppose JPEGs could be okay. Me personally, I like to have options. Don't mind the extra file size. I'm always gonna shoot raw every single time. Now, what about cameras that shoot TIFFs? I don't really see any benefit in that. You don't have the versatility of a raw file or the small size of a JPEG. And as for HEIF, I wouldn't shoot it for the same reasons I don't shoot JPEGs. Plus, it'll likely need to be changed to a JPEG anyway to be used by anyone. I can get all the quality possible I need out of a RAW file. So back to Jeremy, he shoots RAW and he edits his images in Photoshop. He's using layers to edit and that's another way to edit non-destructively. This video isn't a Photoshop course, so I'm not gonna go too far down that rabbit hole, but it's possible to apply filters and adjust exposure using layers and you can go back later and then make changes on those layers without losing any quality and destroying any of your image. Now, Jeremy, you said you're flattening your images to save space, which yes, it does. However, once you flatten it, you lose really all the benefit of having those layers. So I would say just go ahead and save it out as a JPEG. The only advantage to saving a flat PSD is that it's uncompressed. So if you're gonna do more edits and you don't need those layers, you won't have the image degradation that you would by opening and resaving a JPEG too many times. If you work in PSD or TIFF, then when the image is done, just save out a JPEG as the final image for delivery, unless you have a client that requires an uncompressed format. Now, whether you should keep your layered PSD files just depends on you. If you wanna go back and re-edit, I would personally keep them at least temporarily until I'm completely done with the image, whatever that means. Now, I'm glad that you shoot raw and you can always go back and start over, but if you've created a complex Photoshop document with many layers, channels, and paths, you might not wanna start over again. For me, I don't do, do too much work that requires a bunch of layers. I shoot everything raw, I work in it on my Capture One catalog, and then I just export JPEGs for my clients. If I need to make changes, I can do it all non-destructively in Capture One and just export a new JPEG anytime I need. It's simple, high quality, and works great for me. 
What do you all do? Do you keep large PSD files? Do you shoot RAW or JPEG? Does anyone shoot TIFF files in the camera? Let me know down in the comments below. Remember, you can send in your photo questions to askdavidbergman.com. If you like these videos, I always appreciate you hitting that like button and of course, subscribing to the Adorama YouTube channel. Click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new shows come out for myself and all the hosts right here on Adorama TV. Thanks for joining me and I hope you'll come back next time right here on Ask David Bergman.